the world changes soon can get a doobie on a plane but there's uzis in our schools every dude who touched a boob or a booty getting me too what you expect from the kids who went to hooters after school we're all triggered and defensive we're all racist and we're sexist we all grew up watching south park how are we offended now being fat is beautiful name a thing that you can't do jumping jacks run a mile live past 42 man it used to be cool to just flip a bird to the system and now it's trendy to be triggered and pretend you're a victim it's my race it's my weight it's because i'm a christian i hate the internet and anyone who Welcome to the Red Pill Sports and Entertainment Show. I am your host, Albert Apache, and as usual, we are brought to you by Open Source, Self Defense, Fitness, and Grappling. Okay, guys, we got a pretty good show for you today. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about who's number one and what went down in uh, that match that I was looking forward to, Roberto Jimenez and Gordon Ryan. We're also going to talk um, about uh, the things that are going on in Dallas and the Dak Prescott issue. Uh, Jerry Jones, um, clearly uh, in the driver's seat there. Uh, possibility of Russell Wilson coming to Dallas. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, young men and something that, um, you know, us older gentlemen need to really start emphasizing and teaching young men, uh, particularly that there's no need for them to rush into a marriage or rush into a relationship when they're young, right? When they're between the ages of 16 to 22, 23, there's no reason for them to rush to uh, tie down a woman. And so we're going to talk about those things. Honestly, there was so much stuff that went on this past week could do a show, an entire show on every single topic, but, um, you know, time is of the essence. And so, uh, we're going to cut it, you know, to just a couple of, uh, ideas on each topic and move on. Um, Hey guys, check it out. If you like the content, please make sure you subscribe. Uh, please comment down below, even if you disagree with me, um, and hit the like button and, uh, the notification bell would be awesome. And uh, I'm going to be trying to get this content out uh, more and more regularly. I feel like I've done a pretty good job so far, guys. And uh, the more support I get, the easier it is. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right, guys. So, as discussed last week, uh, this past Friday was Roberto Jimenez versus Gordon Ryan at Who's Number One. Gordon stepping in for his little brother, Nikki at the last minute. So let's go ahead and take a look at the match. So the very opening of the match, I mean, right off the bat, you, we're going to see Gordon here. He's going to sit to guard, and he's going to take his left hip and kind of try to play a half guard. Roberto looks to be trying to pass. He makes a pretty good decision here by trying to go towards the right of Gordon, but Gordon's able to get that hook in, use the collar tie, and almost nearly get a sweep here. Roberto does an outstanding job here. Look at that sprawl. Amazing sprawl. Gets his hips flat to the ground and is able to drive up and come back on top. The problem is, as Roberto goes into his passing, he's given up inside leg position. We can see that Gordon has his right foot on the inside there. He's going to come up sit back or step back and get into the saddle position 411 position great leg locking position sits back to his hip gets roberto onto his now as roberto is defending he leans over to his right really really hard um, really trying to keep his legs protected here trying to find a way by time to get out of this position gordon uses this time to come up and sweep and come on top and once he comes on top, he's going to go into his passing sequence. Now, after a while of trying to pass more nimbly, Gordon's going to settle into this kind of half guard position and go into a more classic uh, pressuring style of passing. He's going to look to establish the cross face with that left arm. Once he has the cross face, He's going to start to try to peel the knee off with his elbow, using his right elbow. Now, what I didn't realize at the time, and it's very uh, eye-opening to watch closely, is really what he's looking for is to get into this hand fight with Roberto over on his right side. 
as he's trying to peel this knee away because what he's really looking for is this underhook. And as he establishes the underhook, now he can jack up that arm. He's going to tripod and he's going to knee cut to his left side. And if you notice how high his arm, he has Roberto's arms, that's very beneficial. He, of course, gets the side control here and eventually he works his way into mount. From the mount position, he's going to be looking to continue to attack. So he kind of works his way into a high mount position. And from the high mount position, he's going to look to transition into the S mount here. Now, to Roberto's credit, Gordon is attacking the arm bar. And somehow, as he attacks, Roberto finds a way to roll through and escape the arm bar. I, I don't know how he found the space. That looked locked in, dead to rights. Roberto is an amazing competitor. Unfortunately for Roberto, just a few minutes later, we find ourselves in almost the exact same position. Gordon up high, uh, both underhooks, and he again transitions to the S mount, attacks that exact same armbar. Roberto attempts to roll through, kind of using the exact same escape, but unfortunately, Gordon has learned from his mistakes. So, Gordon Ryan with the win. This was a really exciting match to me, guys, mostly because we got to see a really young fighter up and coming, Roberto Jimenez, against the best of the best, Gordon Ryan. And he looked like he belonged. Um, he didn't look any worse. Yes, he lost the match, but he didn't look any worse than some of the people that we've seen Gordon Ryan beat uh, recently through submission. Uh, what I really liked about uh, Roberto's approach was the fact that you know, he stayed busy, he kept attacking, and he did what he thought he had to do to win the match, which is give us an exciting match. All right, guys, let's go ahead and wrap it up for this segment and move on. What is up, guys? Let's go ahead and get into this segment. As I had talked about and uh, discussed a few weeks back, I said that Jerry Jones really needed to play his hand slow and use the leverage that he has. That the leverage of the Dak Prescott deal is completely in the Cowboys' hands and that, in fact, Jerry Jones had to slow play his hand. Now this, from Adam Schefter. Okay, guys, check it out. So, Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson has not demanded a trade. His agent, Mark Rogers, told ESPN, Wilson has told the Seahawks he wants to play in Seattle, but if a trade were considered, the only teams he would go to are the Cowboys, Saints, Raiders, or Bears. This is a remarkable remarkable discovery in what is going on in Seattle and in regards to Russell Wilson. If you ask me whether or not Russell Wilson was an upgrade from Dak Prescott, I would say absolutely, positively, without a doubt, you are going from a B-plus quarterback to an A to A-plus quarterback. This is, he is clearly, Russell Wilson that is, is clearly a top three, maybe if you want to tweak things around, you can get him down to a top five quarterback in the league. Not only that, but Russell Wilson has proven to be very elusive within the pocket. He has proven to be very durable. He has a proven track record of success. He also has been proven to be a force multiplier, meaning that he takes guys who would be average in other offenses and he makes them better. Which is why right now Dak Prescott is a B-plus quarterback and not an A quarterback. Because he is not a force multiplier. It is actually the opposite with Dak Prescott. Dak Prescott is a quarterback in the same vein, okay, in the same vein, not the same quality, not the same talent, okay, but in the same vein as Andy Dalton. He is a type of quarterback that needs a supporting cast around him. Interesting to note, 
Adam Schefter states here that Russell Wilson also has a no trade clause in his contract. So in the end, when it comes to a trade, he does hold the cards. I don't think it's a mistake that, number one, his agent mentioned the teams that he did, that he mentioned the Cowboys, and that he mentioned them first. Jerry Jones right now has all of the leverage in the Dak Prescott negotiations. It is time for Dak to either realize that he needs to sign the deal under the terms which Jerry has offered, or the Cowboys need to look at how can they possibly trade for Russell Wilson. I would be talking to Russell Wilson now. If I was JJ, I would be using my back channels, whatever is the legal thing I could do to get into Russell Wilson's ear. I would say, what would it take to get you here? What do you think we could do to get you in the silver and blue and make you wear that beautiful star on your helmet? What can we do? Uh, you can't deny it. You cannot deny that Russell Wilson is a complete upgrade from Dak Prescott. What this also shows you is, is that Russell Wilson is also very aware of what people have in the cabinet as far as offensive weapons. The Cowboys, the wide receiver trio that they have is amazing. Okay, Their tight end in Jarwin is starting to blossom. Their running back, Zeke Elliott, let's be honest, I think Zeke had a really tough year last year because he was trying to do too much with the loss of Dak. Um, you look at the Saints, really a couple of plays away from really getting to the Super Bowl. Uh, Drew Brees kind of puttered out, kind of lost some gas towards the end of the season in the last couple of drives. Couldn't really push the ball down the field the way he would like to. Couldn't be as elusive, as scrambly as, uh, you know, maybe an Aaron Rodgers would be. The Raiders, they have a really good offense, and they got John Gruden, who is an, a quarterback guru, okay? The Bears, an amazing defense with some pretty decent weapons, okay? Not the best weapons, but again, because Russell's a force multiplier, he will be able to do a lot there. I think that the names of the teams that he mentioned are in order of, hey, these are the places I am willing to go. Notice, these are either places that are maybe a quarterback away or, in the Cowboys' case, I don't know if they're a quarterback away unless it's the right quarterback. A quarterback who can make the take pressure off the defense by scoring a ton of points and making other offenses one-dimensional. It's also interesting that he would mention the Cowboys because of their offensive weapons, meaning he is somewhat aware of his own legacy. So this is by far the most interesting, jaw-dropping, drama-filled news we have gotten in regards to the Dak Prescott scenario. It will be interesting to see what Dak's agent responds, if they respond, because right now I have to say that Jerry Jones and the Dallas Cowboys have Dak and his agent on the ropes. Um, I mean... Really, what's the point? What's the point right now if you're Dak Prescott? You're really pushing your luck. You've had a second surgery. I understand you think you've earned that money, but business is business. The NFL is a business. It's not personal. Um, reality is, is that they have no idea if you're even going to be the B-plus quarterback that you have been when you come back. They don't even know that for sure. Okay, There are some real concerns about the health of that leg and if you're a Cowboy fan, to deny that, you're just putting blinders on. Do I think Russell Wilson can take the Cowboys to the Super Bowl? Absolutely. I absolutely believe that if Russell Wilson came to the Dallas Cowboys, depending, of course, on what the trade was, if they gave away too much, they would have a very small window, which would be next season, and that would be about it. If Jerry Jones is smart, 
and he's able to maybe find a way to sign Dak and trade Dak on the franchise tag to Seattle and get Russell Wilson in return, maybe giving up a second round as well next season. Then possibly getting Russell Wilson, I do believe he could definitely take the Cowboys to a Super Bowl appearance, if not actually win the championship, particularly with the weapons that he would have in Dallas. All right, guys, that's what I got for this segment. Super happy, super excited. Uh, this just makes things so much more fun when this kind of news breaks. All right, let's move on to the next topic. Okay, let's go ahead and get into this topic. So check it out, guys. Um, this one's going, this is a red pill alert, major red pill alert. If you have not taken your red pill uh, for the day or you have not started your regimen of daily red pills, you most likely are not ready for this particular uh, topic today. Um, this is going out to uh, specifically younger guys. Uh, and when I say younger guys, I'm talking to young men all the way down to about the age of 16. Um, and primarily 16 to probably about 22, 23 years old. Okay. Now, I know that um, a lot of you out there uh, that are, you know, 18, 19, you're probably upset that I'm including 16 year olds here. And those of you who are probably 22, 23 are probably upset that I'm including teenagers in here, but it will soon be understood. So if you're a young man um, in that, you know, roughly, what is that? Five to six year window, seven year window, you need to listen up. Okay, this is something that's not taught to young boys and men, in my opinion, in our culture anymore. And I'm going to tell you that it's been a recent event that I've seen in my particular uh, life, uh, my particular jiu-jitsu academy, um, that I feel that, you know, it's my responsibility to go ahead and bring you guys this red pill alert and this moment. Okay, so... First and foremost, understand your value, young men, um, and understand how your value works when it comes to the sexual marketplace. Okay, you do not need to settle for a woman simply because she gives up the kitty cat at a young age. Okay, here's the thing. Your value is going to continue to rise as you get older, okay? Number one, if you're in the lower part of that age bracket, you most likely are going to start to develop into your man's body and you won't really peak into your full man's body, full testosterone. You've been working out, muscles really developed where they should be and all that kind of stuff. So on a physically attractive uh, scale, you know, your face filling out, catching up to your ears and your nose and, uh, you know, that long giraffe neck that a lot of us have when we're young men, you're not going to catch up to all of that and really feel all the way out until you're probably about 25 years old. Here's the thing about men. We age very, very well. 99% of men, okay, maybe that's an exaggeration. But a majority of men age very gracefully, okay? And what I mean by that is we age like fine wine or like a very good scotch, okay? Men get better with age in looks, in physical attractiveness. Next, your value monetarily, okay? Your ability uh, to generate resources, income, uh, your access to resources uh, will only increase with time. Now, I know this is not a politically correct thing to say, but I really don't care. Okay. Women are attracted to men that have resources. It's an unfortunate fact, but it is, and it's unfair. It's completely unfair. But the reality is, is that as a man earns more and becomes more productive, has more access to resources, becomes wealthier, he becomes more attractive to the opposite sex. 
That's just a fact, okay? Now, it's not fair because it doesn't work the opposite way for women, right? Um, you know, most guys do not talk about, you know, when they get together with their guy friends and they're talking about, you know, the hot females that they've dated or a hot female that they're dating or when they're talking about their amazing wife, very rarely do you ever hear a guy talk about the amazing amount of money that his wife or his girlfriend or the girl that he's dating or attracted to makes. And that's because it does not matter to men, right? Men have absolutely no care in the world or very little care that a woman uh, has a career or how much money she makes at her career um, or where she's at in, you know, the hierarchy or pecking order at her particular place of employment. Men don't care about that. Um, the only thing that men tend to care about when it comes to women and their jobs and their career, and I, and hopefully young men, you take this with a grain of salt and you understand that this is what you should be looking for, is that at the very least, she has some kind of drive, she has some kind of potential, she has some kind of ambition, and that her whole plan is not simply just to find a man to take care of her so that she can have babies, um, but that she's going to be in it for the long haul, uh, whether that be having children and supporting uh, your dreams and your ambition, or whether that be you know her doing something on her own and continuously trying to improve herself. Now, here's the catch, guys. This is just my personal opinion. You all find the kind of woman that you want to find. But if you want to have a happy life, do not follow the stupid ass advice of have a happy wife. That is idiotic, very dumb, uh, nonsensical uh, advice, life advice. It's actually probably the worst advice couples wise that anybody could ever give you. Okay. Here's the reality. If you make, if you think that you will have have a happy life by chasing your wife's happiness, you will never be happy and neither will she. Okay? You are not in control of her happiness. You have absolutely nothing to do with her happiness. That's her responsibility. Okay? Her happiness is her responsibility just like your happiness is your responsibility. All right? So, stay away from that. In all reality, what that means going back to your resources and your careers individually is that nine times out of 10, you should be the deciding factor of where you guys go into the future when it comes to whose career matters most. And the reason for that is this. As women get older, their clocks will be ticking. Their biological clock will start to tick. When they decide that they want to have children, Let's say you get together and she doesn't want children at first, but she gets to be about 32, 33, and now she wants to have kids. When she decides to have kids, if you've subjugated your career to her career, what's going to happen is her career is going to come to an abrupt stop or to a snail's pace while she is pregnant. It will do this for a number of reasons, and I don't really care if it's fair or not fair or what it should be. It is what it is. Part of it will be because of her, her choices. She will want more time at home. She will want more freedom to make different things for the kids, things of that nature, meaning that since she has less ambition, she is less apt to go that extra mile, to do the extra work, to go after that next promotion. What does that then mean for your family? It means that because her career comes to a snail's pace, but because she has been the primary breadwinner, it means that your family has grown accustomed to a certain level of lifestyle, which will then have to pull back because you have, if you have subjugated your career to hers, means that your career is not going to be in a place to where you can command the kind of resources and pay that you need to in order to 
continue to subsidize that lifestyle. And so this is why, okay? Now, young men, why am I telling you and reminding you that you get better as you get older and not to chase the woman's happiness in order to ensure your happiness or your happiness as a couple? Here's the thing, okay? As men, whether it's fair to women or not, we don't have to just date within our own generation. Men have access to five to six generations of women as we get older. As you get older, particularly as you come into your early 20s and mid 20s, you start to not only have access to the generation of women that you grew up with, okay, that were closely associated to your age, i.e. high school aged girls when you were in high school as well. But then you have access to the generation that is also one generation, maybe two, that is older than you. As those women who are older than you start to age out of the sexual marketplace by either, you know, they're just not as desirable because they're older, or maybe they get married, or whatever else may come their way, you also start to have access to the generations that are behind you. And so when you reach about the age of 40 to 50 years old, you will then have access to four to five generations of women. You will have women in their 40s, in their 50s. You will have access to women in their 30s. And in their 20s, as you hit your 50s, you have your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, and possibly, possibly if you would like to go that way, up into the 60s, right? And even as a 55, 60-year-old man, if you've taken good care of yourself, you could still have access to 20-year-old women. Now, some people may say this is not fair to women. That's fine. I'm not saying don't get married, be a bachelor your whole life. That's not the message I'm saying. I'm saying that there is no rush for you to have to settle for a woman simply because she's in your age bracket and she's giving up the kitty when you're a young man. Here's the biggest problem, guys. The biggest problem you're going to run into is that you're going to settle for a girl whom in your small sphere you think is, you know, maybe a, you know, I don't know, let's say one rating above you. So if you're, let's say, a five, maybe she's a six, you think that in your small sphere, you know, well, she's a six, Oh, awesome. I'm dating above my, my grade. I should lock this down. The problem with that kind of thinking, guys, is that her grade will diminish over time. Not only that, but she's a six amongst your crowd. Most likely in the wider realm of the world, she was probably a four or a five. Okay. But I digress. The real problem is, is that as you get older, as she ages out of her 20s into her 30s, she's going to slip a notch, maybe half a notch. If she's lucky, she'll be a 5, a 5.5. Guess what, gentlemen? You will actually, if you've continued to take care of yourself, better yourself, you will jump up from a 5 to a 6. You can even possibly get as far up as a seven, most likely. Because women look at not just physical attractiveness, but they also look at access to resources as an attractive quality, you could even boost yourself all the way up to, a, to an eight or a nine. By the time you're in your 30s or 40s, yet you will have settled for this female who was a six at one time and diminishing. 
So young men, do not settle. And if you think you're ready to marry, if you think that you want to be in that place, I would wait until you're at least in your mid-20s, maybe your early 20s if you want to get married young. And I would make sure that the female that your core team is at least two levels above you. So if you are a five or a six, right, she should be a seven or an eight. Because by the time you hit 35 or 40, you guys will finally be on an even playing field. You'll both be, you know, sevens. And this will create a more balanced relationship and therefore a more healthy relationship. Okay. Now, the reason why I brought this up is because this also ties back into jujitsu in the sense that many of these very uh, demanding women that if you try to make your wife happy in order to have a happy life, many of these demanding women will be the same women that will want you to step away from the mats, that will want you to take time away from the mats, that will not want you to pursue those things because they want you to spend time with them. Who cares? They don't care that what they really mean is they just want you around orbiting them. They could be at home watching TV, watching Netflix, painting their nails, doing their hair. They want you orbiting around them making your life about them. Okay? That is not a healthy way to live life. Okay? They'll guise it behind all kinds of things, how they're lonely. They'll guise it behind how they worry about you and your safety. And, oh, they don't want you to get hurt. Can't you take up something else? They'll they'll even tell you things to try to, to push it like, Oh, well, can't you do jiu-jitsu early in the morning? What if you went to the early morning class? What if you went to jiu-jitsu on the weekends? What if you did jiu-jitsu here, there? What if you did it over this way and that way? And what if and what if? No. The, the answer to all of those questions from your female is no. You do jiu-jitsu and you do it for yourself. And that's how it is. Jiu-jitsu is one of those things that will help you to grow yourself as a man that increases your value. And the sad state of affairs, the sad fact of the matter is, there are some women out there. Actually, there's a lot of women. It's, it's actually probably a scary number, close to the majority, who do not want you to better yourself. They inherently know somewhere deep down that in fact their sexual marketplace value is diminishing as they get older and the last thing they want is for yours to increase. Okay? And I know that doesn't sound right and I know that sounds uh, pessimistic, but it's not. It's realistic. So young men, understand your worth. You're not going to hit your stride. You're not going to hit your prime until 25, 35 years old, somewhere in that window. And by that time, hopefully, if you've done everything right, you've educated yourself, you made yourself better. And when I say educated, I don't necessarily mean college, okay? But you've educated yourself, you made yourself a better human, you're getting more access to resources, you have the ability to get what you need from society, you will be a higher value. You're better looking physically. You'll feel better physically. Everything about you will become better with time. And your marketplace, your sexual marketplace value will go up. So do not settle. Do not settle for the six when you will end up being a seven. Or an eight. All right, guys. That's what I got. Hopefully, if there's some ladies out there listening to this, you play this for your sons. 
you let them understand that they have value. It's the whole world is not female. It's not just about women. Young men need to be propped up too. And they need to understand there's no rush for them to get married and they do not have to settle. All right, guys, that's what I have for this segment. Um, we're going to go ahead and we're going to move on. All right, guys, we're going to get into this little bonus segment of uh, the Red Peel Sports Show. Um, while I was actually trying to edit the video and stuff, uh, this is when this story broke. Um, so that's why it's not uh, closer to the uh, Roberto Jimenez and Gordon Ryan match breakdown. But um, this is essentially, uh, it looks like Gordon Ryan and Andre Galvao uh, got into, you know, a pretty heated exchange of words at who's number one, uh, leading to uh, Gordon Ryan slapping Andre Galvao. Now, according to Gordon Ryan, um, you know, there's some video out and not really sure about the timeline of events, uh, their backstage arguing and things. I don't, you know. Again, not really sure if that's before or after the Craig Jones match. Um, that being said, uh, after the Craig Jones match, uh, it was very clear. They can, you can see it on video. Um, you know, Gordon goes over to shake hands with everybody from the uh, Ronaldo Jr. Uh, bench, all the coaches, and Galbell flips him off um, rather than shaking his hand. Now... You know, it, I don't know what's going on, neither here nor there. I was not there. What I can say is, is that, you know, uh, if you have a beef like this, and if it's not, quote unquote, real, okay, uh, this is one of those times where, um, you know, this would be one of those instances where you do the thing that is uh, cordial, right? Another coach, an opposing coach, you know, comes over to shake your hand, particularly after um, his guy just submitted your guy, you shake hands with that guy, right? You shake his hand, you tell him, you know, thank you very much, you know, whatever, whatever, because in that moment, in that moment, the, your beef is second fiddle, right? Your beef is second fiddle to the two competitors that just walked off the mat. So in that instance, you know, that's my personal feeling about it. So, you know, um, that's just is what it is. I feel like Galvell made a mistake. I'm not judging the guy. I don't know him personally, so I wouldn't sit here and try to say he's a good guy or a bad guy or something like that. I feel like he just made a mistake. I just feel like it was, you know, it was uncalled for. You could have shaken hands, you know, in the moment and kind of moved on. But apparently, um, let's go ahead and read through the article here. Gordon Ryan and Andre Gavell have been going back and forth on social media for quite some time. And it seems as though things have finally come to a head. And the two cross paths backstage at who's number one. It all started after the final match of the late, latest who's number one event where Ryan's teammate Craig Jones defeated Otto's black belt Ronaldo Jr. by heel hook. Um, by the way, if you haven't watched that particular fight, um, if you have low grappling, you probably want to watch it. Uh, it was lightning quick match. Um, just, I think it's just too big of a, uh, learning curve to ask these guys who compete in the gi, um, and under IBJJF rule sets in particularly to make the jump into no gi and to defend the, uh, how can I say? the intricate and complex leg locking system and attacks uh, that the Danaher guys throw at you. I mean, you know, it, they do a very good job of attacking the legs and using those attacks to either pass or then attack the upper body or vice versa, go after the upper body and then switch and go from upper battery attacks to lower body attacks. Um, it's just a really thorough uh intricate system and if you haven't been worried uh, about your legs and you're so used to being able to grab a hold of somebody's gi uh in order to do your defenses for like straight ankles and stuff um it's just 
I just think it's too much to ask these guys to jump in at such a high level. That's just my opinion. But anyhow, I digress. Um, after the match ending, ended, everything seemed pretty cordial and respectable as the two teams met on the mats to shake hands, and Ryan extended his hand to Galvao, despite some of the recent beef he had with several members of Autos. That was where it started when Galvao decided that he'd refuse the handshake and flip Ryan off instead. Well, that was definitely a moment worth remembering and a clear sign that there was no love lost between the pair of ADCC double champions. Things got even worse when Galvao caught up with Ryan backstage. As he approached Ryan and the two started to argue, Ryan fired off two quick slaps to Galvao's face and it was clear that the young grappler was in no mood to argue. As he continued walking to give his post interview, Galvao continued following him, and the pair then exchanged even more heated words as the Knights' other competitors started to be attracted to the chaos. So, in this instance, um, it sounds like from the reports, right, Galvao instigated this. Um, you know, it, if you flip the guy off when he tried to shake your hand, and he, and he's like, okay, fine, whatever, and he walks off, and then he's walking away from you, and you go running to catch up to them, okay? I don't care what beef you had prior to that. You're instigating this particular altercation in this moment, right? And so, you know, it doesn't matter, you know? He could have slapped your mama, right? If he slapped your mama two months ago, and, you know, you've bickered about this back and forth all this time, it, you know, whatever, and now you're running up, you're, you're instigated, that's enough time that's passed, that now, you know, you're the one instigating this particular uh, altercation. The footage and images on the exchange were posted on Flow Grappling's official Instagram account, and several high-profile names in BJJ community have already weighed in. So let's see, Lucas Rocha. I really like this guy. Um, he's, uh, you know, he's kind of the bad guy of uh, BJJ right now. Um, uh, kind of reminds me of like Chael. <laughs> uh, disrespectful, unnecessary, unprofessional. Um, let's see, Orlando Sanchez. And that's what happens when you talk tough online, but you're not about that life. OMFG, congrats Gordon Ryan for destroying the entire Atos name with two monster bitch slaps. Oh gosh. Oh goodness. Regardless of where you line up and what your opinions are on the situation, it's easy to see why so many fans are eager to see Galval return to ADCC 2020 and defend his Super Fight Championship against Gordon Ryan. Although, seeing as he's recently asked for a million dollars in order to sign, on for the match it seems unlikely that it will come to fruition unless this recent incident has been enough to encourage him to take the match regardless all right guys so here's the thing um it, i don't know if uh galvao is being serious about the one million dollars um i don't know if this is all we're all getting played and this is all orchestrated by you know Danaher Death Squad and Autos um, to pump up the numbers. Maybe they're trying to make, you know, jiu-jitsu uh, a pay-per-view friendly event, uh, you know, get more eyes on, on the show. Um, but other than that, other than that being the strategy, um, I'm really not impressed. I'm not impressed with uh, how this is going down. I really feel like the fans are going to be uh, left behind here. We're not going to get to see the matches that we want to see. Um, I mean, let's just be real, okay? Galvao is asking for UFC headliner type money, okay? And honestly, even more than most UFC, you know, uh, the numbered cards, right? The pay-per-view cards, even more than most UFC main event champions are guaranteed a million dollars for a grappling match that's just outrageous either either you're shooting really ridiculously for the moon to back it down right or or you're trying to poison pill the match 
you're trying to poison pill it because you don't want to have the match. I mean, here's the long and short of it. Galvao has been on the scene uh, for a very long time. A very long time. Um, I would say Galvao has been doing it longer, right, than Gordon Ryan. Um, He's been on the scene longer than Gordon Ryan. And so I think that, you know, I would understand why Galvao would feel like, you know, he has everything to risk and it's high risk, low reward. Um, but at this point, the reality is he's probably starting to diminish, right? Uh, the Otto's name will start to erode if he doesn't take on Gordon Ryan. Um, and not, and, and it do, has nothing to do with him winning or losing a match, right? It has nothing to do with him winning or losing the match. It's the fact that, you know, jiu-jitsu is already getting um, a lot of red flags, a lot of warnings, and uh, from the old school jiu-jitsu community that, hey guys, you know, you need to make things more real. You guys have to be more tough. Like, it's becoming a point system kind of game and you're going to turn it into taekwondo you're going to turn it into karate and so you know you really need to guard against that you're getting that message from the old school guys so you already have that message that you need to you know uh, toughen up and and make it more like a fight and so that's starting to erode um, some of the sport jiu-jitsu stuff Right. Uh, in particular, I can say like, you know, the 10th planet system. Right. It, I, I love the 10th planet idea and concept, how it was born. However, that being said, the fact that, um, you know, the 10th planet system is is becoming more and more sportive uh, is starting to kind of diminish it. Like you don't see it as talked about or as used in MMA. And that's what it was even developed for in the first place. And so you see a lot of this. And, and you also see the rise in, in the popularity starting to be gained by, uh, you know, Gracie Academy and, and Gracie Combative CTC affiliates, right? They're, they're starting to gain popularity. And that's because they are speaking to the traditional uh, idea and practice of self-defense. And so... If Galvao does not, you know, go forward, it's going to be really hard to rebuild Autos. And I have to believe that, you know, as an affiliated uh, set of gyms, I have to believe that the Autos business model took some kind of hit because of the COVID lockdowns. I mean, you know, either you're having to let gyms go because they can't afford to pay the affiliation fees or you had to defer them or lessen them, right? You couldn't, there's no way that they could have been charging the full amount of the fee the whole entire time and, and we're getting it from every single gym. So um, I just feel like, you know, this is on Galvao to, to take this match. Um, Gordon Ryan, I think he'll be at ADCC. I think he'll fight whoever they put in front of him. That being said, uh, whether or not Galvao shows up, you know, and whether or not he takes the fight, that's a different story. But a million dollars, um, that, that's just not going to happen. I mean, that is just not going to happen. Like I said, that that's UFC uh, main event money, right? And for and unfortunately, as much as I love jiu-jitsu, let's just be real, jiu-jitsu is not on that level yet in popularity. All right, guys, that's what I got. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up for this episode. Thanks for listening. Um, once again, guys, if you like the content, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And, um, you know, comment down below, man. All the interaction, it really, really helps. It helps the algorithm and uh, helps get my name out there. And uh, thank you all for listening. And remember, be practical, be purposeful. Yes, it was a purpose, guys.
every dude who touched a boob or a booty getting me too what you expect from the kids who went to hooters after school we're all triggered and defensive we're all racist and we're sexist we all grew up watching south park how are we offended now being fat is beautiful name a thing that you can't do jumping jacks run a mile live past 42 man it used to be cool to just flip a bird to the system and now it's trendy to be triggered and pretend you're a victim it's my race it's my weight it's because i'm a christian i hate the internet and anyone who has an opinion and everybody angry if you say white okay fine pass me the brush and i'll paint my face to the shades right let's talk about abortion sorry tell me how this works bacteria is life on mars but a heartbeat isn't life on earth weird